finding products to sell. When I started in business, this was a relatively easy task as most goods were made in this country. Many towns and areas had their own speciality. Most pottery came from Staffordshire. Factories in Leicestershire produced large quantities of shoes and any amount of metal goods were produced in the Black Country area, around Birmingham and Wolverhampton. A trip to the local library and I could find anything. Unfortunately, that is not the case now, with goods being manufactured abroad and imported by the container load. The internet only made the problem worse. I would enter an item on Google and up would come pages and pages of websites containing similar items to the one I was trying to find. Setting Google to view images was much quicker as I could ignore large numbers of items which were obviously unsuitable and just concentrate on the ones with possibilities. Most of these were of course a waste of time since some were from people who did not actually have the item but were prepared to make some for sufficient quantity, usually several thousand. Others were from large organisations that sold nearly everything and sold at a very high price. What I needed was an actual manufacturer, stockist or importer who was prepared to sell to me in reasonable quantities at a resale discount. Not easy. One solution I found was to get an old trade directory, such as Kelly's, from the days before the internet. I would then make a list of firms able to supply the items I was looking for, plus any I had found on the internet. Sometimes a firm appeared on both lists, which was a good thing because it meant it was a well-established business. Next, I would set Google to Maps or Street View and feed in the addresses one by one enabling me to see the actual premises. Many proved to be a disappointment, the factory having been demolished or someone new was in occupation, but I usually found one or two by this method who turned out to be good and reliable suppliers. I do know of people trading on the internet, however, who have encountered problems with potential suppliers. The supplier insists that all their distributors have an actual retail shop and will not supply people working from home or from a warehouse. I always made sure I looked after my suppliers by paying them on time. As well as the goodwill it produced with suppliers, it also meant that if I wished to open a credit account with some other supplier for a different range of goods, then my existing supplier could be relied upon to give me a reference. Keeping my suppliers secret from my customers was also essential. I have spent many an hour transferring goods from the supplier's bag or box bearing their name or address into plain boxes that I could then send out. The ethical problem. Although this can affect many areas in our lives, I include it here because it can be particularly relevant in sourcing products to sell. As an animal lover I would not trade in anything which involves any aspect of cruelty to animals and am fully in agreement with all the legislation banning the sale of products derived from endangered species. Others may have other priorities, such as where a product is made and by whom. The answer is, of course, very simple. If in doubt, don't do it. There is always a profit to be made in something else. There is, however, a grey area where we can become involved inadvertently. To take an example, Terrorists and other criminals can make their bombs using components and materials available from household and gardening supplies companies. Most customers will buy these items for use as intended, but there was always this small risk. It is best to keep records of customers' and suppliers' details where possible, and if a problem does develop, be prepared to submit these to the relevant authorities if necessary.